Okay, our final discussion today is on image quality, and that's a big umbrella term. One of the most difficult ones for us to define, um, but we'll talk about how these digital imaging systems handle image quality. So anytime we think about quality, um, it's helpful to recognize that it's one of those things that we kind of just know it when we, when we see it. So I've got a picture here of the Quality Inn in Des Moines, Iowa versus the um, Ritz-Carlton residences in Bangkok, Thailand, right? We can see between these two places of residence which has the higher quality. There's something about the Ritz-Carlton that just draws the human eye, right? It has a higher quality. So it's something that's difficult to say why, but it has that higher quality factor. When we watch certain people play basketball, they have their game is just that much higher than other people's game. And it's difficult to say how their game is that much higher, but they are clearly a higher quality athlete, right? The same difficulty we are faced with when we're talking about quality. So I'm gonna to try to put as much terminology on it, right? But recognize that at least at some level, it's still a subjective determination, right? The machine does not see things subjectively. We do, but um, that's where these terms will help us understanding how best to relate to this equipment and to get good patient uh, images. So the first thing we'll talk about is brightness. Um, then we'll talk about differences between spatial resolution and contrast resolution. We've already alluded to it, that there's a distinction. We'll, we'll define it a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about all the things that impact our image quality. Right? So brightness. Brightness just refers to the appearance of an image on the display monitor. It's one of the reasons when I first came into this classroom, I did not like the projector, right? I knew that having this projector would reduce the overall display brightness there, right? And I knew that that is impactful when I'm trying to show images up here, that the way that you're able to perceive what I'm talking about with these fine details of contrast is going to be influenced by the display brightness up here, right? Um, we can be aware of lighting conditions and things like that in our imaging facilities. It's one of the reasons why, even though we're no longer reading film, we still read in the dark. The radiologists still sit in a dark room because they want that luminance, that brightness of the screen to be that much more apparent. They don't want any noise from the overhead lights interfering with the, the, the image brightness. No amount of technical um, uh, adjustments change brightness. Right? It's just a monitor setting. It's how bright did you set up your phone that day to be when you look at the screen on your phone. What we can talk about in some great detail is contrast. And the reason I'm pointing that out about brightness is back in the day we talked a lot about image density and things like that. So depending on what your mass was, the image would be more or less dark. It would be more or less bright, depending on what the mass was. What I've just said is, forget all of that, it's just how bright the screen is. Mass does not control how bright my computer screen is. I do, I type it in with my fingers, right, my computer screen. What we can see changing with the digital system is this contrast resolution. So this has to do with how well the system can detect subtle changes in the shade of gray. Now why the heck does anyone care about these subtle changes in gray, right? And the answer is, that's where the diagnostic values are. Each one of those gray colors is tied to a different attenuation profile inside the patient's body. Pathology sometimes has a different attenuation value, right? And so if I can detect the difference in that attenuation value as a different gray value, then I can make a diagnosis, right? So. Contrast resolution is related to the bit depth of those pixels. It has nothing to do with the spatial size of the pixels. It has to do with how much gray can any one pixel store, right? So we said 2 to the 8, 556 shades of gray, right? So in digital, as we increase the KVP and lower the mass, we can lower the patient dose without affecting image contrast. So if you were to look at, I should have brought in my old Merrells, and maybe, maybe I will. I'll show you the Merrells that I studied when I was studying for the registry. 
um, what, 15 years ago versus your murals that you're studying for the registry off. And guess what's different? The KVP. Why? Because my murals was written for the world of film. Your murals was written for the world of digital. So everything that you've memorized up to this point, you don't need to go memorize anything new. Just know that this is a, something we recognize pretty quickly on these digital systems. We can increase KVP across the board and reduce mass, improve our images while reducing patient dose. It's a win-win, right? What becomes significant for us in this digital world is how do we control for scatter, right? Because these image receptors that we're using now are even more sensitive than film was. Um, even though they have a greater latitude, they're that much more sensitive to backscatter and to noise. So I've talked a little bit about um, spatial resolution. Um, and I've just said that the smaller the pixels are, the smaller the pixel size, the higher the spatial resolution. For the purposes of contrast resolution, it has to do with how much bit depth does it have. Right? How many different attenuation values can it store and recognize? Typically the way that we talk about this is within the modulation transfer function or the MTF. Now we don't need to get lost in the weeds on this one, but it is a way of representing what the spatial frequency is of a given system. So I've alluded to some this spatial frequency question. How small are these little tiny pixels. So I'm shifting gears a little bit. I'm moving from a discussion of contrast resolution versus spatial resolution, and now I'm talking about spatial frequency, right? Um, as, a, as an aspect of whether the image system has good quality, right? So the first part of image quality I said is these questions of spatial resolution and contrast resolution, right? The next part of this discussion is has to do with spatial frequency. How well can it represent information? So this has to do with the overall efficiency of the entire system. So it's a really quick and dirty way to look at a computer system and say, yeah, that's the one I want. Knowing what the modulation transfer function tells me, how small a thing can this system image, right? Generally, it's expressed as a ratio between um, the image and the object size. So we take a known object size that's very, very small, we image it with the system, can the system detect that very, very small object? How well it detects that object is what we refer to as spatial frequency. So here's an example of the kind of phantom that we use for this. This is a spatial frequency phantom. You x-ray this and you look at the little tiny lines, right? I'll pass this around so that you can see. And if if the, line, if the system can see smaller and smaller lines, it has a better and better modulation transfer function. So feel free to look at that. This is expressed as a percentage value. So um, there's different systems that we're talking about. We've talked about PSP or CR systems. We've talked about flat panel detector systems. The flat panel detector system particularly the direct radiography system, is going to consistently have the best MTF. It's going to have the highest value. So we want a number that's close to 1. The numbers are 0 to 1 for modulation transfer function. They're basically a percentage value. The closer it is to 1, the closer it is to 100% representation. Right? It can represent that tiny, tiny object 100%. Generally, it's something less than that. It can't be greater than one, but it's often sometimes less than that. Well, what would be the things that would make an MTF less than 100%? Well, things like the phosphors that we use, like the europium doped barium fluorohalide used in a PSP system, it emits light, that light spreads, that can cause light pollution, basically. Right? Um, the term for that light spread Oh, it just, it just slipped out of my mind. I'm sorry. Um, so anytime we see that light spread, uh, it, it reduces the system's efficiency. It would reduce the modulation transfer function. It's not able to represent something that small because from that small on, it's just light spread from the phosphor. Okay? The more the light spread, the lower the modulation transfer function. So the important thing to recognize in this discussion is that some of the noise that's on our picture comes from the system itself. 
It came from the phosphor itself. It came from the way that we acquired the image, right? You know this, and you recognize this all the time. It's one of the reasons y'all tease me about having an old iPhone. If you look at a picture taken on an iPhone 5 versus the one taken on an iPhone 10, which one, which picture is going to look better? The, the 11 now? Yeah. Oh, Lord, I'm behind the times already. I did not know that. <laughs> so clearly the 11 is going to have the better picture, right? Why? Because there's less system noise. They literally have the same camera pixel size. They have the same camera pixel size, but one of them has a more efficient way of acquiring data. It got rid of more noise. So, right. One thing that um, us old folks and you young folks have in common is none of us like noise, right? Noise is a problem in any of our systems. So anything that interferes with the formation of the image, we're gonna call noise. Whether that happened inside the patient, or inside the imaging system, wherever it happened, we're going to call it noise. Um, the two kinds that we're most concerned, so noise is this umbrella term, the two kinds that we're most concerned with are things that happen within the system, so anything that's caused by the detector elements, um, the way the tube is functioning, things like that. And then the other is quantum noise. This is um, things generally related to, no to scatter. So quantum noise, a lot of what we're talking about is just kind of nerdy terms that people use to make themselves feel smarter, right? But you do need to recognize that like quantum model may be used on the boards. It just means the way that scatter looks on a digital picture, right? That's all it means. We can express these um, as ratios, right? We can quantify noise to some degree, right? The two ways that we'll talk about it is the noise power spectrum, which is a new term to me, and the old, the good old fashioned term is signal to noise ratio. The noise power spectrum describes the spatial frequency content of the noise as well as its spatial characteristics. So what the heck does that mean? Um, the higher this NPS gets, the higher the noise is for a specific detector, right? That noise would eventually start to influence whether or not we can see tiny objects. So that's all that's saying is that the noise gets so great we can no longer see something that's tiny. If it's tiny, it has a high spatial frequency. There's a lot of them. Right? Versus a signal to noise ratio, how much noise can be tolerated by us? Right? Um, so as the signal to noise ratio increases, that's a good thing. It means that there's more signal and less noise, right? Generally, with almost all digital systems, to increase the SNR, you have to increase patient dose. That's especially true in CT. I can get you crappy pictures on a CT scanner at a low patient dose all day long, right? Or I can figure out, I could also get you beautiful pictures on a CT scanner and totally fry all my patients all day long, right? Because I'm saying that for the most part, especially with filter back projection, signal is tied to how much x-rays I'm throwing at them, how much that signal is. One way to think about it might be like this. You go out to the waiting room to get your patient, right? And they're like, of course, listening to Fox News at like a volume of like 1,000 out there, right? Um, and the patient talks really, really quietly. You will not be able to hear the patient, the signal of the patient's voice over the noise of the TV. That is a low signal to noise ratio, right? So what do you do? You yell at the patient, right, over the noise of the TV. So you are trying to create a high signal to noise ratio. You can't get rid of the noise, but I can increase the signal, right? That's what I'm saying happens in our digital systems. If we can't get rid of the noise, back, backscatter radiation is real. Background radiation is real. We can't get rid of the volume 1000 noise of our lives. We can't get rid of it. These detectors are sensitive to it. So what do we do? We have to increase patient dose to shout over the noise. Fortunately, 
the digital systems are prepared to hear even the shouting over the noise. That's what we're talking about when we say that there's a benefit to digital systems. It is that exposure latitude. We can shout over the noise with the digital system. It's a very sensitive system, but we can shout over the noise and it hears us, right? Um, so exposure latitude refers to how well that image receptor can receive a signal even in the midst of noise, right? This depends on the image detecting system. It depends on all the little hardware, whether it's amorphous selenium or uh, barium fluorohalide, all these little tiny parts, everything that we're talking about. The reason that we're nerding out on this stuff is because it affects, can we see what we need to see? Every single one of these things impact image quality, right? So the higher the dynamic range of any given system, the more values it can detect, right? both good values and bad values. It can detect both the signal and the noise, right? So um, we've got to figure out how we're going to sort out the contrast that's received. So as we talk about exposure latitude, one thing that's kind of in the back of our minds is what is its dynamic range? What are the contrast values it can respond to? So. Um, when we look at these two pictures, we can see that one of them has a slightly higher contrast than the other. The image on our left, image A, has a higher contrast. I see the bones, but I burned off the soft tissue. Right? The other one, I can see the bones and the soft tissue. Now, bear with me for just a sec. If this was a comparison between film and digital, this is it. Like This is such a great picture of how film and digital differ. So I said in the past that film had that narrow exposure latitude. As a result, it also had a narrow dynamic range. These are two different concepts, but they're interrelated. It had a narrow dynamic range. So when I'm looking at image A there, I can see the bone really good. I cannot see soft tissue. The reason I cannot see the soft tissue is because I see the bone. So for film, you either got bone or you got soft tissue. That was it. That was its dynamic range. Either you're seeing bone or you're seeing soft tissue, period. Right? Uh, with a digital system, I can see the bone and I can see the soft tissue. I can see them both. Why? Because it has a wide dynamic range. In fact, I can window and level all day long and I can pull out different contrast values, right? So taking this one digital data set, I can change the window levels and the brightness levels and I can see different values of contrast all day long on this image. It has a very wide dynamic range. So that is an influencer on image quality and it is one of the ways that we combat the noise that's affecting image quality. Pretty much the final thing that we'll talk about um, in this is an, a term that I alluded to earlier, detective quantum efficiency. So you may have had to dust off the cobwebs a little bit on this. I think we talked about in image production. We'll be talking about it a lot this trimester. How well can these different systems represent what's given to them? You give them x-rays, can they give you a picture? That's the DQE. How efficiently can the system convert an x-ray to a useful image? What is the noise in the system? What is the ways that this system is capable of overcoming noise around you, right? So um, this is a measurement of the percentage of x-rays that are absorbed when they hit the detector, because the actual detector elements can absorb greater or lesser numbers of x-rays. The high DQE means you can get a high quality image at a lower patient dose. So high DQE, high quality image, low dose. This again, um, side by side comparison between the computed radiography and flat panel. This is why the government made it a, wanted us to switch over from computed to flat panel. It has a higher DQE. So for the most part, amorphous selenium, amorphous silicon, thin film transistor systems, charge coupled devices, and the CMOS devices have a higher DQE over photostimulable phosphor systems. Said in tech words, right? The um, y'all said you liked the what was the Im the image detector that you liked at Campbell? 
the Samsung is better than the Fuji, is all this is saying. The Samsung is better than the Fuji. Of these, the amorphous selenium detectors have the highest DQE because they do not have a light conversion step. There is no um, noise from produced within the light producing parts of the, the system. There's no light spread, there's no blur caused by light spread, um, and then there's less dose. The problem though is that these thin film transistors limit just how big the matrix can get, right? So we're having to figure out ways to create these systems where there still is enough thin film transistors to catch all the signal. Um, what we're talking about is the amount of pixels that can cover the area of the image receptor. If there's more pixels covering the area of the image receptor, we have a higher spatial resolution, but we also decrease the detective quantum efficiency potentially. So as the technology continues to roll out, one thing to, we're having to watch for is what's the fill factor? How well can this system take the signal and convert it over? Even though it's really, really tiny, was it still able to catch, capture the x-ray beam? So generally, the greater the area of the TFT array, the, the greater the DQE. So we're up against the limits of the technology itself. Okay, yeah, please. Is this something good or bad? Good question. What I'm saying is bad, right? Um, what we're, we're up against the state of the art. This is all we can engineer. We can only engineer a system that's got things that are this big, right? That's what captures the most x-rays, is things that are this big. If I make something that big, it doesn't capture more x-rays. So this is bad for our image. It, is, it affects the spatial resolution of the image, right? So as I, as I make my pixels smaller, what happens to spatial resolution? It increases. But as I make my pixels smaller, the DQE decreases. Those tiny, tiny pixels can't catch the x-ray beam. The tiny, tiny pixels can't catch the x-ray beam. So I'm up against the limits of the technology now. I want the pixels to be really, really small, because then I can see more detail. But the smaller I make them, the less x-rays they're picking up, the less the DQE is. Right? So we're trying to figure out what are ways we can make the pixels smaller and still have a good detective quantum efficiency. Fortunately, it's not a problem that you need to solve, but you will, if you wind up managing a department, you will be asked to buy million dollar pieces of equipment, right? And so having this concept of quality in the back of your mind and all the influencers, the noise values, modulation transfer friction, uh, detective quantum efficiency, these are the ways you're going to parse out like the, uh, the consumer reports version of which is the better equipment because you're going to have salesmen knocking on your door saying hey I want to sell you this one it does all this well really it's a piece of crap like it has a cup holder on it you know what I mean and curb fonders if you're portable but it's got crap for a DQE makes sense I'm trying to make us smart buyers all right thank y'all so much